You're the owner of a small company. Your business is in excellent health, but you work 16 hours a day, even on Sundays, always under pressure. You see your family, but only in photos. Working hard to succeed, right? But what are unbearable are the astronomical amounts you pay in tax. What a racket. Not including social security charges, you're being tracked. You pay too much tax, while others are not paying any at all. How long are you going to put up with this? Fortunately, there's an offshore company for small business owners. Act like grown-ups, set up your company in a tax haven. You'll see, together we can work this out. Gibraltar, Panama, Hong Kong, 0% tax and so many other choices. The offshore company negotiates directly with the tax services of these territories. One more welcoming than the others. So don't hesitate. Join us. Offshore, together we will go to heaven. Tax heaven. Ah, just imagine packing your suitcase in a tax haven. You think it's no longer possible? That the happy country of happy investors is now inaccessible? At the beginning of the crisis in 2008, fingers were pointed at the tax havens. The merchant banks were then dropping like flies. In the news tonight, the storm in the financial markets. Lehman Brothers will file for bankruptcy by the end of the day. Stock markets that begin to unwind, and governments forced to play firemen and buy up the colossal debts of the banks. Banks that had been hiding their financial secrets for years below the warm sands of some welcoming islands. Tax havens have long been tolerated, but now those in powers promise they will be dealt with. All right. Good morning, everybody. For years, we've talked about shutting down overseas tax havens that let companies set up operations to avoid paying taxes in America. That's what our budget will finally do. And now, each time they meet for a summit, world leaders routinely denounce these tax havens, these black holes of irresponsible finance. Forget putting your savings in the shade of coconut trees. The situation is serious. The message, the message is very clear. We do not want them anymore. And the countries that remain tax havens with hidden banking, will be ostracized by the international community. We've been so hammered by this message, we actually start to believe it. Perhaps we were wrong. In fact, if we look more closely, not only do tax havens still exist, but political leaders have also done nothing to rein in those who truly benefit. Big business. These multinationals that relocate their profits to Switzerland or wherever they're welcomed. Multinationals still have as many well-kept secrets in these financial havens. And to keep up appearances, they call it tax optimization. But political leaders have never explained that. Tax havens are one of the tools that develop the dark side of globalization, one that feeds inequality. Because obviously havens are used by the most powerful and wealthy, be they individuals or companies, who will add to that financial instability. Because this is where we can hide risks and will undermine the democratic policies made in the major industrialized countries by taking away significant tax revenue and also undermining the fiscal sovereignty of industrialized countries. How can this dark and secret aspect of global finance be cleaned up? Looking for proof of how companies operate in tax havens takes many weeks. But then one day a source shows up, anonymous of course, but one who will make some extraordinary revelations in the shape of a large file, 47,000 pages of documents, ultra-confidential. The names of hundreds of companies. Among the largest publicly traded companies in London, New York, or Paris, giants of the automotive, luxury, and food industries. The tax arrangements of multinationals and their subsidiaries. 
diagrams, one more complicated than the other, which make no sense, at least to us. What is clear with these diagrams, however, is that they are a tour of the world's tax havens, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, Gibraltar, Switzerland. Complex circuits involving enormous sums of money, often hundreds of millions, or even billions of euros. The accounting firm Price Waterhouse Coopers in Luxembourg set up all these financial arrangements. These mechanisms are apparently quite legal. They have also been validated by the Luxembourg tax authorities. To decipher this mass of documents, we need the help of a specialist, an expert, especially someone you trust. In short, a rare germ. Salvation was found on the other side of the channel in London. The former tax inspector in the service of Her Majesty, exactly the person needed for this sort of investigation. Firstly, to check the credibility of the information contained in our documents. If you get this structure, this lays it out for you. This tells you exactly how they do it. The investigation is on the right tracks. Richard Brooks is now part of the team and becomes the accredited tax expert. Okay. Clap interview, Richard Brooks, premier. Tell us, uh, what exactly happens and how does it work? Well, ordinarily, the, the scheme will have been invented by the advisor um, in the home country where the company's based. So in the case of the British companies we're looking at, uh -huh. they will have come from PricewaterhouseCoopers in London. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Luxembourg will make the necessary filing arrangements with the Luxembourg tax authority, will normally meet the tax official in Luxembourg to go through it with him. Often we hear over a nice dinner in one of Luxembourg's better restaurants. That's the <laughs> usual way of doing business. And then the Luxembourg uh, tax man sits at his desk, gets his rubber stamp out and, and approves the scheme. What is hard to believe is that everything is legal. A French multinational makes profits all around the world. If it brings these back to its headquarters in France, they will be taxed. So the company creates a subsidiary in, let's say, Luxembourg. This subsidiary receives the profits. Then it transforms these profits into a loan, which it duly lends to the French parent company. Obviously, the loan is not free. Headquarters must pay interest on the loans contracted at its Luxembourg subsidiary. The interest payments will be deducted from its French tax returns. And the taxable profits in France have melted like magic. This is legal, approved by European law. So tough luck for French state coffers. In the documents, these arrangements are detailed in black and white. It's almost enough to make the English expert lose his composure. In Europe, essentially. I've been surprised by how blatant the arrangements with the Luxembourg tax authorities are and how open it all is. You know, it seems to me like these are companies telling everything to the Luxembourg taxman like they're priest or something, you know, and they come away with a big tax break. So that surprises me, the way it operates so cynically, so, so deliberately. It, it's billions because, you know, we've seen schemes that involve hundreds of millions. Hmm. Uh, we've seen a number of those and we haven't really looked at all of them yet. So we are, across the, the hundreds of schemes that we found, we, we are looking at billions of euros, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, this, this affects economies. You know, this is, <laughs> this is serious stuff. <laughs> Very serious stuff, in fact. But do all these subsidiaries based in Luxembourg pay any taxes? Time to visit the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. A country where apparently the recipes for beer are not the only things that are a well-kept secret. And the documents are certainly full of secrets. 
There are tax agreements always formally validated in the same place. A stamp, a signature. It seems to be always the same person who signs in Clark's office number six, a man named Marius Cole from the tax offices of Luxembourg. A few steps from the railway station, the headquarters of the Department of Contributions, as the tax office is known here. In the lobby, under the gaze of the Grand Duke, all the appearances of a traditional tax collector's office, with taxpayers getting their papers stamped. And this is where the taxpayers come first. Then they are redirected to the relevant offices. Our elevators are locked and can only be activated with a badge. Not everyone gets to go to the higher floors. Rather, it's reserved for those from around the world who have chosen to do business here. The senior press officer and the head of security act as chaperones. Tax officials, as is well known, prefer to stay in the shadows. Here more than elsewhere. This is their reputation. Well, you wouldn't want your neighbor to know what you have or what you haven't in terms of contributions? Yeah, and what about foreign companies? Yeah, especially them. Especially companies? Well, on all issues, tax secrecy stays within these walls. We wanted to see office number six, that of Marius Cole. Too bad they took us to number five. An interview is scheduled with the attendant. And we even have the right to film his assistant. But not the folders that he's working on. It's a matter of discretion. Our discretion is key. Ditto for the computer screen. But they do leave us the calculator. So what happens when companies are established in Luxembourg? We apply the law. We monitor like you do at home, in your offices, at the finance ministry. We look at the statement, whether the statement is in accordance with the laws of the country, and then we tax them. Filming was allowed just to ensure we recorded that message. But he's not the one we want to see. The office number six, can, can we also go there or not? No, we told you number five. Well, we just want to film the door to office number six. Is that possible? Okay, yes, of course. Finally there, the company's office on floor six, where the mysterious Marius Cole works. Now, this is where Marius Cole is. He's the company's tax inspector. His name and signature are, without exception, on all tax agreements that we have procured. It would be great to meet him, but we're out of luck. No, he's not here. Uh, he's on leave today. The tax inspector asks for a day off. But his assistant, she's at work, as one might expect, given the number of companies the office must manage. Me, I've got 1,300 files. But I have less than others because I'm also Mr. Cole's assistant. And it's not easy. Nearly half of all companies established in Luxembourg go through room number six. Marius Cole's service manages 47,000 companies whose records are stored in this vault. The whole building is secured specifically and fireproof. That way, nothing can be lost. That's the file for companies that pay too much tax. Why do you say that? Why are they paying too much tax? I'm just joking. The inspectors here make jokes about businesses paying too much tax. Perhaps because they prefer not to talk about those that don't pay much unless they do so behind closed doors. 
Vous les enfermez tous là. So you lock them all up, eh? Yes, so you might get a better view of the entrance here. <laughs> End of visit, and we're politely shown the exit. This isn't the place to talk numbers, so off to the old town and the main tax department. With respect to direct business taxation, what is the rate in Luxembourg? Le taux de la fiscalité the rate of corporate taxation in Luxembourg is 28.8%, uh, which is slightly higher than the average of OECD countries and slightly below the average of the European Union. So an official rate of 28.8%. But is there some way for companies to negotiate lower rates, as in the fiscal paperwork that we found? Do they work out with you how, how they will be taxed? No, they don't work out with us how they are taxed, because the tax law is clear on this point. There is no discretionary leeway. OK, so it's not a matter of haggling, then? Not at all? Not something that you do, then? No, that's not something that we do. But if there's nothing to bargain about in Luxembourg, why do companies line up outside office number six? to get the mysterious Maris Cole's signature. This is Luxembourg's great secret. There is an official rate, but that's not what the companies negotiate. What they do negotiate is the base rate of tax. The arrangement means the tax rate applies only to a very small portion of the profits. Imagine your affiliate's profits are like a cake. The tax authorities of the Grand Duchy aren't very greedy. What we learn from the records is that once a deal has been struck, the Luxembourg tax authorities will only take a tiny part of your profits at the official tax rate of 28.8%. These are taxed on a very, very small margin of the capital or the, the funds that go through Luxembourg, and that rate gets smaller the more you put through. It's not much more than a fee, really, oh. for using Luxembourg. How do these deals work, exactly? The richer the company, the less tax that's paid, maybe? There seems to be a sliding scale of fees in Luxembourg. Uh, it's like a, you get a discount for, for dealing in bulk. Uh, the bigger your scheme, the, the lower the percentage fee you pay to the Luxembourg tax authorities. Is it tax optimization? Or is it tax evasion? Is it legal or is it illegal? What we're seeing here uh, is legal, as far as we can see. But there's a question about how the companies involved present them to the tax authorities back home. Mm -hmm. Are they completely open and honest about how artificial these schemes are? I suspect in some cases they're, they're not, that, that they pretend that their arrangements have much more substance than they do mm -hmm. in order to claim the tax benefit. And and if they're illegal. doing that, if they're, if they're misrepresenting what they're doing, then that is tax evasion and that's illegal. That's the problem. Having a bogus subsidiary in a tax haven irritates the tax authorities of the country of origin, where it's considered illegal. Companies must prove that their subsidiaries have some minimal activity in Luxembourg, not simply a front. In tax jargon, this is called giving it substance. Because without the so-called substance, the structure is an empty shell. Some concrete examples are needed at this point. In the documents, there was one tax arrangement under the name of Wendell. A name that may not mean much to you. But maybe Ernest Antoine Sellier might mean more. He's the former head of France's Employers' Union, a.k.a. the Baron, and someone proud to pay his taxes. I always felt that paying taxes was something that, personally, I found quite enjoyable, at a reasonable level, of course. Why? Because I can actually contribute to French solidarity and French public services, and why not? And at a good level. I'm very proud of it. The virtuous taxpayer is an heir of the Vendel dynasty. The French steel empire. At its peak, it employed 60,000 workers. Suffice to say that in terms of substance, it was definitely heavy. But Vendel moved out of steel more than 30 years ago. 
Today, Vendel is based in Paris and manages investment funds. It has stakes in many companies, from industry and chemicals to construction. And those stakes are held by subsidiaries, mainly in Luxembourg. Subsidiaries such as Winvest. According to the documents, a loan of 60 million euros passed through this subsidiary in 2010. The same year, Winvest made half a billion euros in profit. Back to Luxembourg to see what the group's real activities are, the Vendel substance. This is Winvest's headquarters in a residential area of the capital. The ground floor of an apartment block. With a discreet camera, we engage a secretary in conversation as she arrives for work. Hello, are those the Winvest offices here? Can we see you? We're doing a little survey of companies in Luxembourg. How many employees are there here? It depends. It depends on the day? Yes, it depends on the day. And now you're alone? No, in theory, my colleague will be here too. I see, so two of you. Is there any way we might see one of the managers? Yes, uh, he should be here around 10.30. Okay. Is, is the manager from Luxembourg or from France? He's French. Okay, does the manager, the one we'll see later, the one from France, does he live in Luxembourg or he just visits? No, he just visits. So he makes round trips from Paris. Okay, thank you, madam. In the meantime, we take a look at the premises through the windows. At least a dozen offices, computers and telephones, but no employees in sight. Workstations that don't look as if they're used very often either. Or if they are, they're very tidy. But one resident is unhappy with the fact that there are curious strangers. Can I see your ID card? A real police check. And this is the context of the story you're making? Oh, this is a documentary. A documentary about Luxembourg, among other things. She hurries off to alert Winvest's secretary. But by playing the Guardian, the neighbor eventually starts chatting. Yeah, she told me she has all your contact details, so now it's up to the company. Oh, which company? Because there seems to be a lot here. No, no, Winvest is the company that manages all these companies up here, you see. It's a holding company. Like, there are a lot of holding companies in Luxembourg that manage many other companies. Winvest is a large mailbox with 30 companies hosted at the same address. There are holdings everywhere in Luxembourg, and we know why. It's not a secret. It's well known. You don't have to play the, the innocent with me, you know. You know what I mean. That's why you're here. And that's why you want to make a documentary to explain all this stuff, everything that happens. OK, well, thank you very much. Goodbye. Insightful neighbor, that. We try our luck again at Winvest to see if the French manager has arrived. Oh, hello again. Have your colleagues arrived yet? Yes, uh, my colleagues have arrived, actually. I told my supervisor, and he told me that if you want more information, you should contact our communications team in Paris. OK, uh, do you have a pen, please? These are the Winvest offices, but still no sign of the manager. And then a door opens. Hello, Edward Perrin. I'm a French journalist. Uh, we're making a documentary about Luxembourg. Uh, but I'm not able to talk. Uh, there is a communication service. But you are Vendel, right? I, I am with Vendel. And you are? I'm... So to talk to you, we need to contact Paris. Uh, through Paris, yes. OK, and for all these companies with a mailbox here, it's the same? Have to go through Paris? Yes. Do you have regular activities here in Luxembourg? You can't talk, right? No. Excuse me a moment. That's the number. OK, thanks very much. You're welcome. The door closes quickly behind us. The visit was a short one. To know what's happening in Luxembourg, you have to ask Paris. 
The joys of modern communications, no doubt. Hello, how are you? Well, we wanted to know how many people work in Luxembourg at the offices at uh, 115117 Avenue, Gaston Diedrich. The offices in Luxembourg have half a dozen employees, and there are 30 workers who regularly work with Vendel. So there are six permanent staff? They are employees, yes. It's just that there seem to be a lot of empty offices. Just, a, just an observation. What, in the context of the story? Yeah. Yes, but let me repeat it. Uh, we're just 70 with all our teams abroad. We can't be just five, can we? So there's only six employees at this address to manage about 30 companies. But no way to know if they're permanent. As for employees who come, especially from Vendel in Paris, it's impossible to know what they really do here. But the two people interviewed in the office this morning only stayed at work for less than two hours. Having regular employees come down from Paris would prevent Winvest being considered as a shell company. In a judgment against a former employee at Vendel in France, the employment courts considered that the employee was spending so little time there that, quote, there wasn't a strong enough link between the employment contract and Luxembourg. It continued that the work was carried out largely in France and that the former employee only had, quote, an office in Paris. And it's in Paris that Yann Philippin a journalist with a Liberation newspaper has long investigated the activities of Baron Cellier. We show him the documents, hoping he can explain why Vendel is so keen on its Luxembourg subsidiaries. Well, this shows that uh, the taxable net margin is only 0.125%, which is an extremely low tax base. So it's with these figures that Luxembourg taxes this type of operation. Absolutely. We can see that Vendel lends money to one of the companies in which it holds shares, one of its subsidiaries, for simplicity. And in return, the subsidiary recycles the interest back to them and the revenues from the interest. And this is taxed at very low rates through its presence in Luxembourg. It's beautiful, isn't it? But that's not all. The Luxembourg tax office is very accommodating. And it's written in black and white in the company's public accounts. Uh, we can see quite clearly why it's very useful and very profitable to go through a Luxembourg company. Because as it says in the first sentence, and it's pretty funny, it says, quote, the company is fully subject to Luxembourg income tax. But that works out well because for such activities, the chapter states that the contribution, the liquidation of these assets is not taxable income in Luxembourg. And finally, the company is exempt from wealth tax. So there is no tax payable in Luxembourg, so no loss. It's as if the cash is circulating in a pipe and there's no hole in the pipe, so there's no tax. And Vendel, through Winvest, can distribute all of its capital gains to itself and to its management without having paid any withholding taxes at all in Luxembourg. The activities of Winvest, Vendel's subsidiary in Luxembourg, are practically non-taxable. Winvest, it seems, is primarily used to pay some of Vendel's managers, including Ernest Antoine Cellier. A very big piggy bank through which management can help itself to a lot of money. Practices that the French tax authorities do not like. Two Vendel managers have already been sorted out to the tune of nearly 250 million euros in total. In both cases, the tax schemes included at least one step in Luxembourg. Requests for interviews are sent to Vendel, but they don't want to talk, and all are turned down. The solution may be a direct approach to Cellier in person. Fouquet's, the stylish restaurant on the Champs-Élysées. The equally chic MBC club, a circle of businessmen, are hosting Cellier for a signing session of his latest book, titled We're Not Here to Be Yelled At. Hello, could you sign uh, your book for us? Who are you? I'm Edward Perrin. I work for a new show called Cash and I would like you to dedicate your book, because I found it really interesting, and can you write it to Elise Lucet for the cash show, please? The former boss of the bosses seems to have trouble writing the word cash. There's no C, I can't remember, how do you write it? Is it SH? SH, so there's no C, that's right. 
for the cash show cordially. And when asked about Winvest and Luxembourg, he says he's no longer in charge. I don't have much opportunity to dedicate books, you know. While we're interested in what you said in this book, we're also interested in your business, the Vendel Group, and a company called Winvest in Luxembourg. Can you tell us what Winvest is and what is its activity? Listen, I'm no longer in charge of the group's operations, uh, so you would have to ask that question to the executive team. Uh, you, you, because you don't know. No, I don't know. I left Vendel's executive board in 2005. I'm president of the supervisory board now, so please contact the executive board. But, Mr. Selly, are you still interested in the company's profit sharing scheme? Well, what kind of behavior is this? Well, we have to ask out loud, because I went to Luxembourg several times and uh, I didn't get anywhere. Yeah, but listen, uh, you don't have the right to be here. So, we are here to be yelled at, I guess. Ah, the small Luxembourg subsidiaries of our big corporations. It's an embarrassing topic. Because of the Grand Duchy's bad reputation. An image the Luxembourg government would naturally like to erase. They've even produced a series of propaganda films to gun down the received ideas. It asks... Of course not. It's just a paradise for business, which offers custom-made services. It's a tiny country that's become a giant of the world economy. It's politically stable and, with its banking secrecy, a place to invest in safely and discreetly. And the icing on the cake is that Luxembourg is a founding member of the European Union. It also houses the Court of Justice and, therefore, a guarantee of probity. The way they tell it, it's a wonderland for investors. I don't know about you, but one might have a little trouble believing it all, taking into account the documents that we examined. One of the only people who can dispel our doubts is Luxembourg's Minister of Finance, and luckily he's in Paris, in the beautiful residence of the ambassador. We saw several of these documents, and every time in these schemes money passes through the Cayman Islands, Liechtenstein, Guernsey and Luxembourg. Collectively then, the Cayman Islands, Liechtenstein, Guernsey and you are tax havens caught up in the middle of all these arrangements. We apply European law, and which is not the case of the other countries that you mentioned. We can be compared to countries like the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. Uh, which are eminently uh, more... So you completely refute the term tax haven? Oh, yes, indeed. It's an insult to my country, because Luxembourg applies all the conventions of the OECD. I work closely with other countries of the European Union, and you cannot claim that Luxembourg does not apply European law. No, but we, we saw them in these arrangements. You find yourself alongside them in these financial schemes. Once again, we saw them with our own eyes. You are among these countries. You say it would be an insult to my country to be qualified as a tax haven, but you're implicated in all these financial schemes. In your opinion, are the Cayman Islands and Liechtenstein tax havens? I don't know enough about the tax systems in these countries or regions to make a judgment. A kick into touch, as they say in sports. No, no, I just don't want to judge other countries so superficially. If a large French group, through a subsidiary located in Luxembourg, where it has no real activity, uh, pays less tax in France, what, what would happen? If it is contrary to European law, the French authorities must notify me, and I will ensure that this does not happen. Isn't it up to you to notify them? How would I know unless the French tell me there is a problem? You would have your doubts if a French company acted through a subsidiary, though. But you've never asked yourself uh, whether the inverse might be true? I think insofar as the laws are not the same in all countries, 
It's quite possible that through a subsidiary in another country, one could reduce the tax in the country of origin, which is not against the law. If there are abuses of the law, I will ensure that they stop, because I don't want to live to the detriment of other countries to which we owe so much, and with whom we cooperate in an excellent manner. Well, will you commit yourself to that? Oh, yes, absolutely. So that if it happens in the future, you would contact the tax authorities of the country concerned, regardless of the company, and tell them, we're in the process of signing this. Will it undermine your tax services? I could foresee this is one of the ways we could take again in accordance with European law uh, to see if we can further improve cooperation with other states. So you find it a bit shocking. In the manner that you present it, uh, yes, because it gives the impression that people are escaping their country's law. It's the impression we got, frankly, because we went to see what these British or French companies actually do in your country. And what is striking is the lack of any kind of real activity by these companies in Luxembourg. Let me make it clear, I'm not a fan of corporate mailboxes, but a business doesn't have to employ a lot of people for it to be a real activity. There are OECD and European Union rules on permanent establishments. The Luxembourg minister was adamant his country is not a tax haven and it would apply the letter of European law. Comments that irritate our tax expert Richard Brooks, with whom we take the train to the Grand Duchy. He believes Luxembourg is playing a double game. And that it takes the maximum advantage of its EU membership. It offers the, oh, many of the advantages of the tax havens you normally find in the sunnier parts of the world, but with membership of an economic club the European Union, and the club assumes that you have appropriate rules in your own territory. Uh, but, but, but whilst it benefits from, from that privilege, it, it actually has rules that are more like a conventional tax haven. Luxembourg has long had a reputation for excellent management in the heart of Europe. And if the authorities can be believed, it's not the kingdom of mailboxes and obscure subsidiaries of major international groups. That's what we're up to. The fissure is ready to end us. The first leg of our visit with Richard Brooks takes us to the city centre, to an address close to the station. It's not really uptown. However, it's not just a little company that's set up here. We're going to Pearson, what is the Pearson? big, the big publisher, uh, publisher of the Financial Times and the Economist, and all kinds of educational material. So a huge company. It's Seventeen. This is the residence of no less than the group that owns the Financial Times. The businessman's bible, Pearson, also owns half of The Economist. Until 2007, it was also the owner of Les Echos in France. Pearson is also one of the world's largest publishers. 37,000 employees and 8 billion euros of turnover. Any way you want. Now, more than ever, we live in financial times. Its newspapers instruct the entire world on the economy. But in the documents, there is a loan of $620 million, wending its way through a maze of subsidiaries via Luxembourg. The offices of the Luxembourg subsidiaries don't reflect the wealth of the group. They are distinctly unostentatious. Several companies belonging to the group are registered here. To find them, you need good eyesight. Look. Embankment Finance Limited. And here is another Pearson company with the Pearson name in it, Pearson Luxembourg number no. two. We know that this company is owned by this company. Why does it need a branch of a UK company? Let's find, Just find out. out, yeah. That's to be determined. The advantage of Richard Brooks is that he hasn't lost his reflexes as a tax inspector. Hi, is there anybody from Pearson or 
Uh, embankment Finance. That was Richard Brooks. Bonjour. Are you a director of these companies? Some of the companies I am, some of them I am not. And what about the Pearson, the three Pearson companies? Information ones? on the Pearson companies is available at the RCS. Yeah, but we, we don't know if you are because we don't, you won't tell us your name. Well, you can go and look up who works at the RCS. You can go and look up who the directors are. Yeah, and, and if you give me your name, I'll know whether you're a director. Why does it interest you who is a director of these companies? Well, it's kind of interested to get an idea of what kind of presence they have here. Do they have directors here? Do they have meetings here? We have meetings here. Right, they come to this office? They come to this office, yes. Right. How often do they do that? Several times a year, lots of times a year, in fact. Right. This is all available at the RCS. That's fine. OK? OK. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Look at this door. <laughs> 21 companies in there. You know, we just don't know what's going on here. I mean, it's very strange to, to operate companies like that and not even say when you're asked whether you're a director of them. And this is where they decide the finances of Pearson PLC, which is one of the biggest publishing companies in the world. Publisher. Yeah, this is the publisher of the Financial Times and The Economist <laughs> runs its finances here. But are you surprised wow. to see this? Even the way that tax havens operate, they could have afforded something um, a bit more presentable than this. I thought they could put on a better front, but no. Oh. You don't have permission to do that here in the building. So if you want to film, do it outside. Please, gentlemen, leave the building or I'll call the police. Yeah. Got something to hide. We left, but with this question, how much tax does the Pearson Group save with the loan of $620 million? It was too bad that Pearson declined all requests for an interview. In writing, though, the company said, quote, it had always paid all the taxes it was legally required to, the statement added that in 2011, Pearson had paid more than 187 million euros worldwide. Does the Luxembourg tax story shock you? Does your brain hurt? So take a trip to the pharmacy. You'll find Sintol, or Augmentin, or even Clamoxyl, from anti-malaria drugs to a bunch of vaccines. And even toothpaste makes your mouth feel good. Aquafresh, either active, incredible. All these products and many others that are meant to be good for us are manufactured by Britain's GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, the world's third largest pharmaceutical company. Guess what? GSK also has subsidiaries in Luxembourg. The company shifts a lot of money through it. A lot of money. Now hang on tight. From now, we're talking billions. 6.25 billion pounds, more than 7 billion euros, as shown in the documents. It's the equivalent of the annual budget for a good-sized ministry. Why the loan? Well, you know, perhaps it's to avoid paying high taxes in Britain where GSK is headquartered? How? The trick is to make sure the profits, in the form of loans, stay within the corporation. From a Luxembourg subsidiary, back to the parent company. It's neat and effective. By going through Luxembourg, GSK is believed to avoid 40 million euros in taxes in Britain annually. This sleight of hand is considered legal by Her Majesty's Inland Revenue, provided that the Luxembourg subsidiary of GSK is not just a simple mailbox, but a real company with employees, a coffee machine, and offices. Accompanied by Richard Brooks, it's time to find GSK's 7 billion euro subsidiary. And here it is, located in the outskirts of Luxembourg, GlaxoSmithKline International. 
a modest building that resembles a college dorm with more than 15 other occupants sharing the building. Looks like Mr. Glaxo Luxembourg. Practical, these subsidiaries, and the boss is never far away. This could turn out to be an informative visit, especially with a camera that's discreetly placed. First surprise, the manager confirms what's in our documents. I'm with Mr. Brooks, who is an English journalist. You've got a loan, haven't you? You lend yeah. six billion pounds six, six or something. Billion, yeah. Six point three billion. Up in to fact, the UK. Uh, it was a structure, say, up to the UK. But the most interesting news is that the British taxman has been investigating this procedure for a long time. So Smith Klein negotiated with HRM MRC. Yeah, yeah. And they said uh, because uh, the tax in the UK wanted to say that. Uh, they didn't like really, let's say, the, the structure in Luxembourg, yeah. that the profit made in Luxembourg had to be taxed in the UK. Yeah. We had really, let's say, to prove that we have substance, that we have offices, that I had employees, that yeah, we yeah. Are equipment. This is not just a, a post box yeah, that, yeah. that we are. Yeah. But at the end, this is what had to be agreed with the with, with yeah. the and the... Yeah. The, uh, Lengthy negotiations with the British Inland Revenue that has given GSK a pretty good deal. The agreement is to say, okay, we make a deal and provide that this is done for that date, yeah. before the end of the year. This is going to be clear, so it's a give and take. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. The deal is really that this is not going to be taxed. And they have an agreement also for the past that uh, this will go back until 2010 or something like that. I think this is all what I have to, to tell yeah. you. This gentleman has already told us quite a bit. GSK was caught by the British tax authorities who judged the structure to be a phony. And yet the group has escaped heavy penalties for past year's activities. The terms seem to have been that they'll stop this kind of arrangement, but they won't be taxed on the profits they've already put in Luxembourg over the past several years. So it seems they'll get away with what they've done so far. An amnesty, in effect, yeah. You're talking about a tax saving of several hundred million pounds. And what does the finance minister of Luxembourg think of GSK's fiscal arrangements and their impact on public finances in England? When the famous tax rulings allow us, as is the case with GSK, to avoid paying 40 million euros to their country of origin, that's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem. Yes, I agree. And we also asked that question to the Inland Revenue. Yes, I understand it perfectly, but we still need to know the solution to such problems because the creation of a subsidiary is not in itself illegal. No, a subsidiary, no. But if there are subsidiaries that have no real substance, then that does raise questions. Yes. It should be mentioned that in Luxembourg, financial activity accounts for a third of the country's economy. An interview with the management of GSK would be perfect to see how it justifies the Luxembourg connection. GSK, however, declined. In a statement, the group does acknowledge it reached a deal with the British tax authorities, a deal which, quote, would cover the taxes owed on the interest payments. 47,000 pages of confidential documents that we found are of considerable interest. They show the fiscal acrobatics being carried out across the world by the multinationals. Assembly line schemes conceived by the aces of the tax system who work for the largest accounting firm in the world. Price Waterhouse Coopers, which is where we came in. In Price's corporate films, there are people dressed to the nines, working hard in a clean, friendly atmosphere. There's a sense of accomplishment at the end of each meeting. Vim Piot is a partner and tax lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers. 
who works here in the suburbs of the city of Luxembourg. The tax schemes for Vendel, Pearson, GSK and many others were created in these offices. Wim Piot agrees to be interviewed. How many people work for Price? Currently? Uh, Currently about uh, 2,100 people. This is not just a front then. No, it's not. So you have a lot of customers. Yes, a lot of customers. But if you read the various reports, most of our business is auditing. You know that the, the fund sector is, uh, is very important. It was interesting to compare uh, the numbers of employees in your company. Uh, they also provide tax advice. You said there were more than 2,000 employees. Is that about right? Uh, other huge multinational companies like GSK seem to get by with only two people here. Yes, I understand the comparison. But you have a real business here, obviously. Well, yes, we actually have 2,100 people. What interested us particularly when we conducted this survey is that we, we noticed that for companies who came here through you or other audit firms, many of the structures that were created were little more than empty shells. I think that time is over, the time of the mailboxes. I think there are less and less of them. I'm not saying there are none left at all, however. Oh, is that true? Because we saw lots of them. I'm not saying that there are no more of them, but I think there are a lot less. The question is whether a company in Luxembourg, Europe or anywhere is right to look for the path where it's least taxed. Does it have a right or does it not have the right? I think they do have the right to, and there must actually be something concrete, some substance in relation to the structure. That's very important. We will take an example, um, if you like. GSK is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. They contacted you in 2009, and thanks to the structure that you helped create in Luxembourg, they saved 40 million euros in tax in their country of origin, which is Britain. I cannot comment on individual cases. In fact, I, I don't know about this one at all. Well, look, um, you recognize this financial scheme in these documents. And here is the loan from Luxembourg, which goes to the finance department of GSK. These are documents, yes? Is what happened a scam? Once again, I cannot comment on individual cases. I, I just simply can't. I'm also bound by confidentiality, of course. And anyway, I'm not familiar with this file. But you acknowledge these are your documents. And it's clear there is a loan from Luxembourg from the branch that goes to finance. It's possible. In Britain, they're very clear about this, that the companies in Luxembourg are just empty shells. Do you agree? And all I can say is that I don't know this case and I can't possibly comment. That's it. But they are still your scams. You, are, we, are you upset by this? No, no, it's not because of the cases, but for the nth time, I cannot comment on individual cases. Again, and I must insist, because we talked about your business, it's you who advised them about this sort of scheme. And according to my information, you built the tax structure for them, which allowed them to pay 40 million less in taxes in Britain. Mm -hmm. I have no comment to make, that's it. For a good half hour, Mr. Piot makes no comment on the tax schemes that his own teams concoct. And he was more than reluctant to discuss the contents of the precious paperwork. Thank you, Mr. Piot. My pleasure. With 47,000 pages of documents, we were able to investigate three companies, GSK, Vendel and Pearson. Their exotic accounting, euphemistically called tax optimization, has brought in how much money? Hundreds of millions of euros, at least. However, their gymnastics has deprived France and the United Kingdom of a huge amount of tax. You know, the cash to pay for schools, for hospitals, justice, and also tax inspectors. And especially how to begin to repay the public debt, which in France now stands at around 1,700 billion euros. And how much do you think the tax bill should be for our little secret file?